I'm happy to finish this wonderful conference with a, let's say, a theological footnote somehow. One of the most frequently rehearsed cliches of early modern Protestant polemic was a charge that scholastic philosophy had taken unrestrained delight in distinctions and that as a result, theological realities which should never really have been questioned had been dragged through the mud of hair-splitting debates. Humanists such as Erasmus of Rotterdam and Agrippa of Nettesheim had cited an example that would run like a connecting thread through anti catholic treatises right into the 18th century. Could Christ have been incarnated as some creature other than human, for example, as a pumpkin? As late as the 18th century, a Calvinist apologist such as Johann Friedrich Bertram could get into high dudgeon over notions like this. Yet in reality, as it is so often the case, the question had been debated under different premises from what Protestant theology would have us to believe. The Jesuits too discussed it. In what follows, the course of this debate within the Jesuit order will be traced through the example of three authors, Francesco Suarez, Pedro Tardo de Mendoza, and Rodrigo Ariaga. As will be shown, it was Portado de Mendoza who was the first to take a different view, so different that Ariaga felt obliged to present a specific refutation of it. As frequently, the most important systematic approach to the question which provided orientation also for later members of the Society of Jesus was offered by Francesco Suarez. Suarez summarized the whole prior debate and organized it for his successors. Could the incarnation also have occurred in a different nature from that in the comprehensible natura rationalis of man? Almost in passing, Suarez treats a hypothesis that had been posed by John Wycliffe in the late Middle Ages, namely the position that only the one singular nature that Christ in fact adopted in the moment of incarnation could be considered for the incarnation of the word. Reflections such as this, concerned with the perfect microcosm, belonged rather to the natural philosophy of the 12th century and no longer counted in the 17th. Already Augustine in De Trinitate had maintained that Christ, so Suarez, could have taken on any human nature had he so wished. This prompted the question of what other options within the hierarchy of the order of creation might have been open to Christ. Could he have come into the world as an angel or an animal? Suarez first considers the angel. Albertus Magnus had rejected an angelic incarnation. His argument had been the complete simplicity of the angel. In an angel, a separate substance, as Albert and Thomas believed, it was not possible to distinguish between it quod and it quo. Hence, it seemed there could be no possibility for the nature of the angel to serve a suppositum in a person. But, as Soares knew, this objection had been rebutted already by Aquinas. His commentators, above all Cayetano and Francesco de Silvestris, had given the point more weight. In the letter to the Hebrews, Paul had stressed, for it was not the angels that he took to himself, he took to himself the line of Abraham. Did this not clearly convey that incarnation what has also would have also been possible as an angel? The empirical reality of the revelation itself argued for this, Suarez insists. In the three days of Christ's body was laid out in the tomb, we shall hear more and often of this episode, he had assumed the anima separata into a hypostatic union without its suffering any loss. A purely spiritual substance was hence no obstacle to incarnation. Albert's objection could be defunged through a closer consideration of the nature of an angel. There were only two possibilities. Either it was a case that person and natura were present in an angel separate from each other, in which case Christ would be able to assume the natura of the angel without destroying the, its personhood, or 
On the other hand, and as Albert had postulated, the two were completely identical to each other, in which case Christ would have the possibility of destroying the angel's personhood. Here, in turn, one might raise the problem that angelic persons really ought to be indestructible, but such a destructio would be tantamount to a mutatio, according to Soades, and so it would not cast doubt on God's goodness and perfection. That sufficed for the question of an angelic incarnation. A far more complex picture arose from the other option, namely the possibility of a sub-rational incarnation, such as being incarnated as a tulip or horse. Suarez knew that the pre-Scottist Franciscan school in particular had categorically rejected the possibility of an irrational incarnation. Alexander of Hales and Bonaventure had spoken against it expressly because an animal or plant must lack any capacity to receive grace. It had been viewed similarly by Henry of Ghent and Dionysius the Carthusian, a letter thereby winning the honor of a citable authority. Richard of Middleton and Mazilius of England had been at least uncertain with respect to the assumptabilitas of the irrational nature. As so others well knew, animal incarnation had acquired a passionate foe in Pico della Mirandola, who in his Apologia had argued for strict observation of the hierarchy of creation. Only the human soul merited elevation above the nature of the angels through the incarnation and completion of the history of salvation. All other options were ruled out. Yet the majority of medieval authorities had held the opposite view. Durandus had adduced God's freedom as an argument followed, as we might expect, by Don Scotus, William of Ockham, and Gabriel Beale, but also by other major commentators on the sentences such as Petrus de Palude. <coughs> Aquinas, whose position in fact tended to vary, was placed by Soares in this group too, at least if his exegates Johannes Capreolus and Cayetan could be believed. Among the more recent authorities, Jacques Allemand was mentioned, who had argued unreservedly for God's freedom. The view among the church fathers had not differed much from this, so others believed. Already Augustine in De Vera Religione had held, so, so others recalls, that the Redeemer would also have been able to descend into the world in an ethereal body, but he had chosen a human one. The authority had been provided by Tertullian in his conflict with Marcion. The founder of Marcionism had found it scandalous to suggest a descent in the body into the body of a woman, for God could not have been so degraded. In his omnipotence and his readiness to torpedo worldly wisdom, however, the Redeemer could also have chosen a cow or a she-wolf, as his mother Tertullian made clear in his reply. A human body, likewise, could in no way diminish his greatness. Did this not make clear that God was given every freedom in the hypostatic union? The opposite view was found in an heretic, in Origen. The Redeemer, so Origen, had insisted was dependent on the medium of the soul to bind the body to himself in an hypostatic union. The incarnation must therefore take place within the vertical scale of the order of creation. Yet, the revelation itself necessarily contradicted this claim. During the three days in the tomb, the body and the soul of the Savior had been separated from each other. Yet, they were both assumed into the verbum. Hence, so others stressed, the soul occurred as medium in the incarnation only in ordine intentionis, but not in ordine executionis. Blood and bodily humors, too, had remained bound in hypostatic union with the verbum and with the divine nature of Christ during the entombment without a need for the soul to continue forming them as living principle. If the Redeemer had nonetheless also been able to assume his corpse into himself in the union of the two natures, then an irrational nature not ha could not have presented an obstacle in the course of the events of salvation. Even a horse must therefore have been a possibility. An argument that will be of interest, especially for Hurtado, could still be made against this, so are the stresses. 
Personhood was defined in the complex mechanics of the two nature doctrine as an individual substance of rational nature, substantia individua naturae rationalis. An irrational creature was not able to constitute a person, so why would one be able to subsist in the divine person, the divina persona? For Soares, this objection can be swiftly um, cast aside. The persona, too, offered only a mode of subsisting, but every nature capable of substance in a person could also be assumed into a hypostatic union. For the constitution of a person, the divine nature alone was quite sufficient. The union took place in, rationale, in ratione personali without it being necessary that the united nature itself constitute a person. In the same way, Christ during the three days had without a soul been able to assume even the irrational corpse into himself. Ockham had already made similar arguments. However, the objection could be extended further, Suarez admits. Could an irrational nature um, for example, a horse also be capable of assuming into itself the divine powers, the operationes, which are granted to human nature and the hypostatic union. John Damascene had once maintained that the flesh and obed in Christ had shared in all divine capabilities. But was it really so? The beatific, the beatific vision, the visio beatifica, was not a consequence of the hypostatic union, according to Suarez but the result of divine grace. The divine nature did not act as a formal principle of demilitations like this. As recipient of grace, the irrational nature of the horse was thus located at the same level as the rational nature of the human, which was raised to a higher level only by grace. While the animal, because it lacked free will and could not achieve merit, was not capable of sanctification, sanctificatio, Yet this past could have remained bad to man too without divine assistance. Fulfillment in Christ was set in the natura of neither man nor beast, while unification in the word had been an option open both to them, of them. Here again, there was no argument on formal grounds against incarnation as an animal. An entirely different difficulty was bound up, so Ardis admits, with the moral dimension of this process, finally. Was the incarnation as an animal or plant appropriate? Did it meet the maxims applied to divine perfection? Anselm of Canterbury, the most important protagonist of a rational theology, had given a single unambiguous answer to the question whether God could have come to the world in two people rather than in one. Non decet. Christ had taken <laughs> Christ had taken the path that the law of reason had prescribed to him of becoming man. This argument too bore no weight for Soares. Whatever divine omnipotence did was founded in itself. The divine freedom itself set the norm for its morality. Here the model had been provided already by Gregor of Nyssa. All creatures, so the church father had maintained, start in their finitude at equal distance from the divine infinitude. Therefore, no nature could claim a prior rank. And hence, God had no obligation to prefer human nature to any other. As well as a vertical hierarchy of possible incarnations, there was also a second chain of options with a counterfactual content that was located at the level of ontology. Since Christ had taken on human nature and hypostatic union, he had assumed both form and matter equally and with them also the accidentia of human nature. Here too, other scenarios could be imagined. Could God have assumed a form or a matter alone? or even just an accidental property? It was easiest to answer this question for the case of the rational form, which, like the anima separata, was able to subsist in itself. Christ had been able to assume it during the entombment without interruptions. But how did things stand with the other options? Pure matter seemed to present no problem. Although matter did not subsist in itself, God still Still, God could take the place of a form and actualize the matter as the matter's actus entativus in Soares' formulation. 
Some theologians at least had taken the view, according to Soares, that God and not the bodily form had formed the corpse in the grave as a verbum. More difficult was the question of a form existent in the matter. Could it, without the matter, be part of a hypostatic union? And what was the situation with forms that, unlike the former rationalis, were not able to subsist in themselves, it is the irrational forms? So Ardis' answer is cautious. It did not seem sensible to assume a form that was itself wholly bound into the forming of a matter without also adopting the matter as well. However, from his potentia absoluta and omnipotence, God was able to cause to subsist in itself a form that did not possess this capacity secundum ordinem. And what about the accidentals? Late nominalists had extended the omnipotence of God even to this case, as Soades knew. If, as Gabriel Biel and John Mayer, but also Jacques Armand had argued, God had been able to incarnate himself in a former irrationalis without matter, because he was able to grant to his form the gift of existing without matter, why should he not then also, in the case of an accidental, it is in the case of white, have been able to, to, sus to suspend the laws of ontology? The accidental would then have acquired its modus ascendi in the verbum itself, no different from when God had created the soul for himself in the moment of the incarnation. But for Soares, this goes too far. An accidental, for example, snub-nosedness, you know, <laughs> did not form a unity in itself. It was thus not capable of becoming part of a hypostatic union of natures. Later scotists like Johannes de Basulis had taken the same position. Following Soares, other Jesuits of his time took up the question of contrafactual incarnation, including Pedro de Cabrera, Josep de Ragusa, and Gabriel Vasquez. But so did theologians from different orders, such as Pedro de Lorca and Bartolomeo de Medina. Other authors of cursus theologici, such as Juan de Lugo, just one example, had no longer treated the topic. If one reads through the discussions of those authors who found it worthy of a longer airing, it, it is soon clear that they essentially follow Soares or barely depart from his treatment. Vasquez's treatment of his eternal opponent's reflection upon incarnation as an animal or angel agreed with Soares, but on the assumptibility of matter, form, and accidentals, he proposed a slightly different position. Soares had granted to the potentia absoluta the power to include in hypostatic union even forms without matter. Vasquez sets narrow limits on God's room for manoeuvre. To incarnate oneself as an accidental would necessarily lead to absurd consequences. Was God to appear without form or even matter as a great whiteness? Yet if accidentals, since they could not claim any existence for themselves, were excluded from hypostatic union, then irrational forms that were tied to matter too would without this matter also be excluded from the unification of nature. They too were unable to exist alone. Bartolomeo de Medina had gone a step further in his, com in his summa commentary. For the same reason, even God would be unable to incarnate himself as prima materia. But on all other issues, it seemed there was a wide consensus within the Jesuit order. <coughs> Perhaps it was therefore just the moment to torpedo this rare mood of concord. In his commentary upon the questioners on the doctrine of incarnation, Hurtado de Mendoza turned diametrically against the established position. Indeed, he even managed to approach the question in a wholly new way. With respect to incarnation as an angel, Hurtado's attitude is comparatively conciliatory. That person and nature are absorbed in each other need not prevent granting the assumption of an angelic nature, as Hurtado is prepared to do. Nonetheless, Albert's criticism was not to be dismissed altogether. Incarnation as an animal or another irrational creature was entirely impossible, however, as Hurtado stresses with great force. Hurtado is entirely clear that most of his colleagues had taken a different view, and that the Thomists, such as Capriolus and Cayetan II and Scotus and Ockham, had all argued for the opposite position. <coughs> 
Even the patristic authorities cited by his fellow Jesuits, such as Gregor of Nyssa and Augustine, had not been as ambiguously supportive of an irrational incarnation of the word as his colleagues had claimed, Hurtado believed. When Gregory, Tertulliano, or Augustine had, take, had spoken of contrafactual incarnation, that is, as an ethereal body or even as a cow, they would not even in a dream, according to Hurtado, nec insomnio, have wished to formulate an alternative to the actual events of salvation. It had all been more ret mere rhetoric. Nor is Hurtado convinced by the argument that all his colleagues had presented that during the entombment, God had been able to assume his corpse into the world even without the soul. Here, the Spaniard takes a bold position. Had the corpse really been part of the hypostatic union at all? Or had the form of the corpse which remained to it, the former cadaveris, been sufficient for it? Henry of Ghent or Dan Scotus in his Quod Libertalis at least had felt that ideas like these could not be excluded. But if this were the case, it would hardly be possible to infer further options for God from the entombment. Hurtado knows that he cannot muster many medieval authorities to support his position, yet at least Alexander of Hales, Bonaventure, and Dionysius the Carthusian had shared his view. But at a striking point in his Summa, even Aquinas, Hurtado adds, had maintained, had maintained that in the case of an irrational creature, any form of congruitas, any internal accord with the divine nature would be lacking. Hurtado could also find some support in patristic literature and early scholastic theology. As we have seen, Anselm of Canterbury had insisted that the events of salvation were necessarily subject to rational maxims. Huge of St. Victor, too, in his work De Spiritu et Anima, had taken a similar view. Only the anima intellectiva of the human, so Hugh, was able to serve as image of God as the Imago Dei. Only it was hence also entitled to be included in the hypostatic union in the moment of incarnation. And that also made clear that non-rational creatures were too unworthy to be considered for the incarnation of the word, for God worked according to the rules of reason. Patristic citations were not enough, however. In order to argue ex ratione, Hurtado linked the question of irrational incarnations to the issue and canvassed by Suarez and Vasquez of whether also individual forms or accidentals were suitable as vehicles of incarnation. Suarez and Vasquez had excluded accidentals from the union of natures because they could not subsist in themselves. The nature of an accidental property was itself accidental and so could not become a component of the hypostatic bond of two natures, so Soares himself, as Hurtado again stresses, had concluded. Vasquez and Medina had extended this conclusion to wholly unformed matter and to forms that were temporarily immaterial but bound to matter, which likewise could not possess autonomous existence. But if the component of a hypostatic union must subsist in itself, as his colleagues had claimed, then irrational creatures would also be entirely excluded from incarnation. Their forms, too, depend immediately, intrinsically, upon their subjects. If a person was to be defined as an individual substance of intellectual nature, so Hurtado, then God could not have incarnated himself in them. As an alternative, Suarez and Vasquez could have extended the creator's potentia absoluta. God could have sustained an entirely formless matter in its existence through a subsistentia supranaturalis. He could likewise have provided himself as a subject of an accidental. In that case, the events of salvation could also be feasible in the form of prima materia or of snub nosedness. God, God would, however, in this moment have destroyed the true mode of the hypostatic union and redefined it and redefined its conditions. In that case, incarnation as a former irrationalis would be no obstacle. But none of his colleagues had been prepared to go so far, for it was, so it was wiser to limit incarnation to the only reasonable mode, namely to the body and soul of the human, and so to a form that was separable. The second part of Hurtado's argumentation leaves the domain of, the, of ontology and moves into the sphere of morality. 
For could known of the collect see, so hurtado, what unpleasant consequences were tied to lines of thoughts like these, which treated the omnipotence of the creator as an autonomous element without reason or concern for dogmatic requirements? What kind of honor was offered to the creator, so hurtado, if it was felt apt for him to enter the world as a fly or a snot, mos musca sive mucus, and thus, <laughs> to redeem its sins. It was no coincidence that theologians like Bonaventure and Dionysius had voiced reservations. And even Gregor de Valencia had charged that Gabriel Beale was having left far behind him the realm of the theological salubrious. Had not even so as himself, so Hurtado, when he addressed a subsidiary problem, the appearance of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, taken a similar view the columbatio, the manifestation in a dove, so so others had said, could not have been an incarnation simply because it would wholly contradict the dignity of God. Hurtado chooses to, paint, chooses to paint in vivid images a picture of the absurd consequences of a contrafactual incarnation. Suppose God had incarnated himself in a horse and had united the nature of the horse, the, the equitas, with his divine nature in one person. The equine nature would have been elevated above the angels. It would have been worshipped in the community of the saints. Indeed, in the events of salvation, God would have raised himself with the choirs of angels and said to the dwarf animal, this is my son, my beloved, my <laughs> favor rests on him. Horses were produced too. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Horses were produced too, so a horse can have sons. So why shouldn't the address, son of God, also be due to a horse? It could be objected that a horse had no likeness to God, but the human too, stood only in an analogous relation to its creator. The horse possessed no intellect, so Hurtado, but nonetheless a remarkable statement, it possessed a limited form of vis cognoscendi. The horse had no free will and, unlike man, was not capable of true friendship with God. But it could still feel a subordinate form of love. A limited similitudo with God was hence indeed present also in the case of a horse. If, as Soares and Vasquez had claimed, personhood itself was not necessarily a precondition of hypostatic union, then there was no obstacle to including an animalian creature in it either. The creation's power to integrate entities in, incarn in incarnation would then extend to all entities without limits, from the prima materia to those irrational creatures that were placed only slightly below man. Why then would a horse not be a possible candidate for incarnation? Yet sound theological sense, of which Hurtado here regards himself as a spokesman, must regard such animalian variants of the mystery of redemption as going too far. Did theology want to admit such scenarios merely to avoid setting limits to God's omnipotence? This suggests, Hurtado concludes, that we could refrain from such phant phantasmagoria, that we should refrain, refrain from such phantasmagorias. Hurtado was inevitably going to provoke resistance, and he got it, as so often, from Rodrigo Ariaga, who was able to turn the screw one small time. Ariaga himself would have dismissed the issue of a contrafactual incarnation as settled, as, as settled had he not deemed Hurtado a worthy opponent. Ariaga, too, begins formally with the angel as a second possible nature of Christ, but it gives it, but gives it no further attention. The key question was, the, was of the natura irrationalis, which Hurtado had reopened. Could Christ have had himself brought to the world as an ass or a stone? For Ariaga, the authorities that Hurtado had cited in support offer nothing. Tertullian was an heretic, and has no place in a dogmatic argument. Anselm and Hugh had spoken of God's potentia ordinata, but not of his true omnipotence, the potentia absoluta. In other respects, too, the theology of the 12th century, which lived on also in Dionysius the Carthusian, could not be accepted as a standard. 
there was no basis to the objection that only the human soul with its intellectual capacities could form a worthy counterpart for God. The body of an animal, too, is actualized by soul. All capacities that exceed human nature, which were tied to the incarnation, the visio beatifica, the beatific, beatific vision, were an effect of grace. But in the face of grace, as Suarez had already stressed, the animal soul and the human soul were equal. Even for stone, so Ariaga, divine grace would have been able to provide the gift of a vision of God through an elevatio, even if in its own nature it was not suitable to assume the effectus formalis entirely. If the gradation of creation was so important to Hurtado, said Ariaga, then why did he, ju why, then why did he not just cite Origen himself? In the same context, Hurtado had also adduced Thomas Aquinas, who in the Summa had stressed in passing that the irrational soul lacks every congruitas, every proportionality to divine nature. But a lack of congruitas, said Ariaga, need not mean that an irrational nature could block the path of the divine will to incarnation. More important than the authorities were, of course, the philosophical arguments. As regards the parallels that Hurtado saw between the accidentals, which were not to be considered for the hypostatic union and the irrational creatures, which Hurtado also wanted to exclude from it, were they really telling? Hurtado had stressed that a former irrationalist could not itself constitute a person because it could not subsist in itself and therefore could not be considered for hypostatic union. Implicitly, so Ariaga Hurtado had thus presupposed a further property of a non-rational non form. No former irrationalist, for example the soul of an animal, could have the capacity of discursivity or could abstract itself from its corporeality. Epistemically, too, so Hurtado had explained, the soul was inseparable bound to its subject and its matter. Even this claim, which apparently arose for Ariaga out of the nature of a former irrationalis, must appear doubtful in the face of the omnipotence of God. Why would God in the creation not at least theoretically possess other options? As Ariaga argued, he would indeed have been able to create a materia, materia spiritualis, a spiritual matter, and a form joined with it that was bound to it inseparably, that is a mortal spiritual being. Why then, so Ariaga, should such a creature not be capable of intellectual achievements, despite being perishable? But that made it evident that the apparent inseparability of forms, their irrationality, and the possibility of an incarnation were not standing in a logical relation to each other. It is not entirely obvious which scenario Ariaga here has in mind but a look at contemporary works may help. Ariaga's fellow Jesuit Theophile Renaud, at the start of his Theologia Naturalis, which begins with the pure intelligences, runs through the golden chain of being. Would God have been able to set between angel, man, and beast, yet other creatures with independent rank? Renaud had studied Paracelsus and his fellow solely. Further intermediate creatures, nymphs, sylphs, or fairies, spiritual and at the same time mortal, just as Paracelsus had described them, would indeed have been within the competence of the creator. They were encompassed in God's freedom, which would indeed have been able to bridge the theoretical vacuum below the angels. But then, so one would have to agree with Ariaga, God would also have been able to incarnate himself in such a creature as an elf. This, thus it became obvious, the inseparability of forms was not a criterion excluding incarnation. It was of greater importance to Ariaga that the irrational form in itself, whether it be separated from matter or not, should be capable of integration into hypostatic union. If, as Hurtado too had admitted, even free accidentals could obtain their support and their subject in God through divine omnipotence, then there could be no obstacle for subaltern forms of any kind. <coughs> 
In the end, it was again the, as it were, empirical reality of the passion that clinched the argument. God had separated his soul from the body during the entombment. Nonetheless, his body had remained bound in hypostatic union with the word, the second divine person. An incarnation in a sub-rational creature thus could pose no, not any difficulties. Hurtado's second chain of objections, and I come to a conclusion now, was moral in nature, as we have seen, and cast doubt on the honestas of a non-human incarnation. Was it a blasphemy to consider musca et mucus, a fly or snot, as variations of incarnation? Hurtado himself had provided a possible answer to this objection. God would in this way have been able to demonstrate his omnipotence. Optima solutio is Ariaga's dry remark. But he, of course, knows that it needed a better answer than that, for Hurtado had worked through a chain of events of a contrafactual incarnation right to the end. In his answer, Ariaga assumes an almost Leibnizian perfection of the cosmos, which knows no flaw, but in its perfection is not necessarily oriented around man. It was just that all creatures start in the same immediacy to the infinitude of their divine origin, and there could hence be no sequences of rank and no natural privileges amongst them as had already been concluded. God had wished the bonitas physica, the natural perfection and natural well-being of each being, and had brought forth no creature that could lack the propriety conjured up by Hortado. All creatures had been given life for their own sake, without having their functional context in man. The sun and moon sufficed in themselves, so Ariaga, as did the mouse, in which God was well pleased. Why should the Almighty not be able to incarnate himself in them? Ariaga goes into more detail in the case of the horse, Hurtado's example. What had his fellow Jesuit found so shocking about the idea of unio physica with an ungulate? that a horse, too, was capable of being the son of God? In fact, the whole scenario, which ultimately even Ariaga found absurd, of course, could be considered from a different perspective. Non-rational beings, too, were perfect, and on the basis of their perfection were a worthy object of divine love. How did Hurtado know that horses were not capable of love and friendship with God if they were accomplished by the Creator? The divine nature would have been able to assume every creature into hypostatic union and led it to upwards to itself. Why should it not have the right to transform a non-rational creature too? Propriety could not be a decisive consideration. Human nature too abounded in apparent imperfections. It slept and digested and its organic properties were obvious. Nonetheless, Christ had assumed it. Why, so Ariaga asked, should an ass be worse less than a human? Questions of the honestum, where Ariaga remarked, a res mulliacularum, a matter for little girls, not for philosophers. Had it also been objected, so Ariaga, that an irrational creature was not able to accept the gift of God's grace. However, it needed to be noted that in passion, the body and the tomb was at first sight also capable of a, being a recipient of grace and had still remained bound to the word. Thus, God could assume any substance if he wanted to. One, and that's my conclusion now, one ultimately gets the impression that in the debate between Ariaga and Hurtado on the incarnation, two visions of the world are colliding with each other that at least at this level were mutually exclusive. While Hurtado commits strongly to a model which indirectly at least depended primarily on the anthropocentric theology of the 12th and early 13th century, Ariaga represents an entirely opposed view. His theology appears, at least on this issue, downright cosmocentric and removes man from his special position in the universe. From here, it was only a short step to Leibniz and his conclusion expressed in the Theodice that human happiness does not necessarily coincide wholly with the happiness of the creation. On this, Ariaga was without doubt closer than his opponent to the modern era. Thank you so much.